Well, it's great to have you guys here on Pajama Sunday. We'll see how long I keep my Clark hat on. It's very hot, but I do love this hat. Um, it is almost Christmas, which is exciting. The challenge is this is a Christmas that's really like no other. It's a very unusual Christmas. Uh, it's a Christmas that has been in many ways overshadowed by hard things, things like the pandemic and the election and all of that. And as a result, as I talk to people, I've, I've noticed that there's just a lot of discouragement and stress this year. And to some extent, there can always be that at the holidays, but it's more than usual this year. And we're actually seeing that. Studies are showing that, that the rates of, of discouragement and depression and anxiety and loneliness are at an all-time high in our country right now. So we know that a lot of people are really struggling, and that makes sense because all of us are grieving losses to some extent or another this year, whether it's a loss of a loved one, whether it's a loss of a, of a job or of health or of a savings account or of plans or hopes or a vacation or whatever it might be, this has been a rough year. And that means it's a really tough Christmas holiday. And so this morning I wanna do something a little bit unusual and I wanna encourage you to turn to Revelation chapter four. Revelation chapter four because as we talk about this challenging holiday season that is so rough, I want to help you understand that as rough as this one is, it's nowhere close to the worst Christmas ever. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. The worst Christmas ever to give us some perspective and actually give us some comfort as we face a holiday season that is so unusual and so difficult. So whenever you struggle with Christmas, whenever you feel like it's, it's Christmas time and you don't feel into it, you feel stressed, or you feel discouraged, or you feel lonely, you feel um, disappointed, my encouragement for you is actually to turn to the book of Revelation. That might seem like a very strange Christmas book, but it works really well. I will show you here in a moment. If you go to the book of Revelation, you will learn about what is indeed the worst Christmas ever. It'll help frame things and help you understand how good we actually have it. So that's what we're going to look at. Let's look at Revelation chapter 4. This book was written by the Apostle John when he had something just amazing happen to him. He got to go to heaven. He got to have a vision of heaven. He got to see what it's like up there. And he's going to talk to us about that starting in chapter 4. So if you'll look with me, we're going to start in chapter 4, verse 2. John says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven. And one sitting on the throne, and he who's, who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. And out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf or an ox. And the third creature had the face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. So let me set the scene here. For a moment for you. As, as John peers into heaven, what he sees is at the center of heaven, kind of the focal point of all of heaven, is God. God the Father sitting on his throne, and he looks majestic, glorious in appearance. John is searching for words to describe it, and the only words that seem to do it justice are things like gemstones from the ancient world or a rainbow in the sky. So it's kind of like that's kind of like lightning flashing. This idea of God the Father being glorious in appearance is common in Scripture. So in the book of Ezekiel, God the Father, if you were to see him, he's described as, as glowing metal, just ringed with fire. And Daniel, he's like white as snow on a throne that's surrounded 
by fire. In the book of, of 1 Timothy, it says that he dwells in unapproachable light. Like you can't even look at him. He's so bright. So that's a common theme. God the Father in his unveiled glory is the center of heaven. And then um, next to him, or what John describes as before the throne, so closest to the throne, you have these seven lampstands, which are the seven spirits of God. That's a strange translation. It's really sevenfold spirit of God. It's talking about the Holy Spirit and the idea of the Holy Spirit looking like a lampstand um, described as seven. That's very common. Old Testament imagery is in the ancient world, seven meant the number of perfection. So it's talking about the, the Holy Spirit's perfect power his perfect holiness, his perfect glory. So around God the Father is the Holy Spirit and all his power. And then there's this thing called a glass sea. We don't know what it is. John's just searching for words. It's something bright. It's like a massive sea that's just reflecting the glory of God like crystal does. I, I like to think of it, if you've ever hung one of those little crystal pendants in a window in your house and it catches the sunlight and refracts it like rainbows all around the house, that's what it is, just much more glorious, much bigger. So here at the center of heaven, we have all of this glory, all of this brightness. And then John describes what's around the throne. There's these two concentric circles of creatures around the throne. The first are these four crazy-looking angelic creatures. We, we don't know what they are, but they're powerful. Six wings full of eyes. Um, each one looks like an, a different animal from the animal kingdom. We have one that looks like a lion. That was considered the noblest of creatures. One that looks like an ox. They considered that the strongest of creatures. One that looks like a, a man were considered the wisest of creatures. One that looks like a flying eagle who they thought was the fastest of creatures. The point is, these four angels are, as best we can tell, the most powerful angels there are. So the most powerful created beings, full of eyes, that's a metaphor for they're always standing guard over the throne of God. They're like his honor guard right around him. And then around them, you have 24 elders, and we don't know who they are. We don't know if they're angels or human. We just know they have a lot of authority because they have crowns here in the center of heaven. And these elders and these four living creatures, all they do day and night is praise God. They just offer unceasing praise to God the Father day and night. They sing of God's attributes so that he is holy, holy, holy. He is completely separate from sin and corruption. He is completely distinct from his creation. He's almighty, meaning he's the king of kings. He does whatever he pleases. No one can stand against him. He's eternal. He has no beginning and, and no end. He is always existent. And so this worship by these four angels is apparently just so amazing that these 24 elders who are powerful and mighty, all they can do like all day is fall down. They're just constantly falling down before God the Father and placing their crowns at his feet and worshiping him. So basically chapter four is kind of like the, the unending worship album of heaven. So it's playing all the time. All of this amazing worship, amazing soul-stirring praise offered to God the Father who is so beautiful and majestic you can barely look straight at him. So that's the center of heaven. And in the next chapter, chapter 5, we get to kind of the main event of this part of the book of Revelation. It starts with a problem. So look with me at chapter 5. John continues, he says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, so God the Father, a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. Now, a little background here, this this book, which really better translation would be scroll. It's a scroll that's sealed up. And it, this scroll is, is the plan of God for the end of this world and, and the creation of a new heavens and a new earth where there's no more sin and no more pain and no more death. So that scroll being unrolled means God is, is finally gotten to the place where he's going to recreate and he's going to make everything right again. But the problem is there's no one in heaven who's worthy to open the scroll and begin the plan. No one can start the plan that God has for the new heavens and the new earth because no one is worthy until a new character enters the scene. That's what happens in the next verse, verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book in its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb. Standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. 
And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And so we meet this, this, new, um, this new character who has the authority to take the scroll, who has the authority to launch the plan of God for fixing all that is wrong in this universe and bringing about the new heavens and the new earth. And this new character who is worthy, this is Jesus, the Son of God. He has the authority to bring about the new heavens and the new earth. And notice how John describes them. It's very interesting how Jesus is described. John mixes his metaphors. So in one verse, he describes him as a lion, and one verse, he describes him as a lamb. And in the ancient world, you couldn't put those two together because they were polar opposites. Lion was, was the symbol of strength and might and invincibility. A lamb was a symbol of weakness and humility and sacrifice. And yet John says Jesus is both. He is the lion who is the lamb, and he has overcome his enemies. He has overcome in a very unexpected way. He overcame by dying, by being slain. He has conquered sin and Satan and death once and for all. And John says he has seven horns on his head, and that sounds really weird, and you're thinking, like, what, how, can that, how could you fit seven horns on a, on a It's a metaphor. It's an image. The idea, horns in the ancient world were a sign of a warrior. That was like a, a mighty warrior. And seven, again, is the number of perfection. So seven horns means he's the greatest warrior who's ever lived. Yes, he's a lamb, but he's also a warrior who is invincible. No one can stand against him. No one can make him do anything he doesn't want to do. He is almighty. So Jesus is described here. Yes, he's a lamb, but he's a mighty warrior, lion, lamb. He's powerful. He's almighty. He has the strength to begin this end-time plan that God the Father has. So I read that, it reminds me when I was a kid, I liked to build things. Oh, I still do. But when I was a kid, I really, I loved to build things. And sometimes when my dad was at work, I would go to the garage and I would take his tools and use them to build something just for the fun of it. So one day I wanted to put together some boards. I had kind of a plan for something. And so I looked around the garage and I found a glue gun. I thought I will glue them together. The problem was my dad did not have a hobby type glue gun. Like the little one you see it at like Hobby Lobby and you use it to put together some little stuff. My dad had an industrial, like commercial grade glue gun. You had to use two hands to hold it. It got phenomenally hot. It could melt metal. But I grabbed it anyways because I thought, well, this will work. And I took it up to my fort and I started putting these boards together. And it was really heavy and it got too heavy for me at some point, And I dropped it right on my hand and I still have the scar today. It went right through the flesh. And what I learned that day is you don't mess with powerful things. You got to respect the power that they have. You have to approach them carefully. And, and I think that that's an important word when we get to Christmas in America and we think about Jesus. He's not just that little Hallmark figurine, that little plastic baby Jesus that sits forever in a manger. He is the almighty lion. He is the almighty warrior who is powerful and invincible. And we need to respect that and understand that. And interestingly, the angels do. They don't make that mistake. They understand how great and powerful this lion who is a lamb is. And so they respond to the arrival of Jesus with more worship, powerful worship. So look with me at, at how heaven worships Jesus. Let's pick it up in verse 8. When he, that is Jesus, had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood. Men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you've made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and a number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. This worship song as it progresses grows in the number of singers. You may have noticed that. Starts with a few grows a very large number of singers. And so it starts with just the four living creatures and the 24 elders. 
So, so just those 28 creatures, and they are singing about Jesus being the Redeemer. And apparently their song is so inspiring that then the angels join in. And John tells us there are myriads of myriads of angels. A myriad in Greek means 10,000, so that means 10,000 times 10,000. Billions of angels around the throne begin to sing of the, the worthiness of Jesus. And that is so amazing that it inspires all of creation, everything in creation, to sing about the glory and the worthiness of God and of Jesus. And the amazing thing to think about for a moment, if it means really everything in creation, it means Satan too. It means the demons too. This worship is so powerful, they cannot help but bow the knee and agree, yes, he is worthy. Everything in creation worships the greatness and magnificence of the Son of God. This is the most powerful worship song in all of history. It's so powerful that all the, the creatures, all the, the, those four angels, those 24 elders, all they can do is fall down and say, Amen, yes. You, Jesus, are worthy. Okay, so what does all of this going on in heaven have to do with us going through a Christmas that feels kind of overshadowed by sadness and stress? Well, the point of all of this is to show you guys that no one at any time has ever experienced a worse Christmas than Jesus. Honestly, no one has ever been through a worse Christmas than Jesus Christ. How do I know that? Because he left that. He, he was there. Like that was his unending existence until he left it that first Christmas morning. And where did he go? He leaves the glory of the Father in the bliss and paradise of heaven to come here, to take on human flesh as a baby in a manger. He comes to, not to, to a palace. He comes not to the body of Chris Hemsworth. He comes to a manger in the stable in the midst of poverty in a body that is unremarkable. Nobody noticed him. He chooses to be born in squalor and filth on that first Christmas morning. No one has ever had a worse Christmas than Jesus Christ. I love how Augustine put this. He said, man's maker was made man, that he, the ruler of the stars, might nurse at his mother's breasts, that the bread might hunger, the fountain thirst, the light sleep, the way be tired on its journey, that truth might be accused of false witness, the teacher be beaten with whips, the foundation be suspended on wood, that strength might grow weak, that the healer might be wounded, that life might die. Your creator chose to leave the beauty and bliss and perfection of heaven on that first Christmas morning. He had the worst Christmas anyone ever has. And so if you're feeling stressed or disappointed or discouraged this Christmas, I want you to remember a couple things. I want, want you to take away a couple things from this message. The first is if you're down this Christmas, I want you to understand that Jesus understands your disappointment firsthand because he's, he's been there. He is not angry that you are not enjoying his birthday. Neither did he. I think that's important because for some reason, I think some mixture of being Christians, being Americans, being in the West, we feel like we're supposed to be happy every Christmas. It's important you have to have all this cheer. He didn't. No, he understood. Christmas, yeah, there's things to celebrate, but it was incredibly humiliating for Jesus. It was an unbelievable sacrifice for Jesus. And so he understands the, the discouragement and the pain that you're in because he's been through it firsthand. So you don't need to feel guilty if you're not enjoying Christmas. Instead, you need to turn to Jesus for comfort because he didn't enjoy it either. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is also one of the shortest, very, very short verse, just John eleven thirty five. 35. It says, Jesus wept. Um, if you know the story, this is when his friend Lazarus died. And the remarkable thing is Jesus, being the son of God, he already knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead and that the result would be lots of glory for God and lots of people coming into the faith. There would be lots of good that would come from it. And yet when he goes to Lazarus' tomb and he sees Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, weeping and grieving and suffering from the death of their brother, he weeps. That's so powerful to me. That God who knows all things enters into that emotion and experiences it. Jesus wept. He understands grief firsthand because he experienced it. 
He understands loneliness and despair and loss firsthand because he went through it. That's a common theme in the Gospels. I'll give you just a few examples. There's many more, but John 4 tells us that Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. So have you ever been like hot Texas summer sun and you've been out working all day, you've been outside all day and you just feel utterly fatigued? You feel weak, you feel painful, you feel sore, you feel completely exhausted. Jesus knows that feeling. He actually, where he was living, Samaria, climates quite a bit like Texas in the summer. He knows that fatigue of body, that weakness that comes over you because he's felt it firsthand. Here's another example for you, Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry and the tempter came. Jesus understands hunger and thirst firsthand. He knows what it feels like to go without food, probably much more than any of us do. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows that feeling of very difficult temptation. He's been through all of that. Here's another example, Matthew 26. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane, the last night before he was crucified. Jesus went with them, with the disciples, to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and watch with me. This is the night he was betrayed, and it tells us that he experienced this intense grief and distress. You could translate distress as anxiety. He's feeling deep anxiety. So if you've ever had a, a night where you're, you're, you're trying to go to bed, you're sitting there, and you just feel anxiety gripping your soul. You feel shortness of breath. You feel worried. You feel the taste of cortisol on your tongue because it's just coursing through your body. Maybe you're, you know you're losing your job, or maybe you're worried about your child. Or maybe you're worried about how you're going to pay the next bills. You don't know how that's going to come together. You have a health scare, and you're just terrified. And you feel that intense stress down deep in your gut. This is Jesus right here. He experienced that too. He knows exactly what that feels like. It's not theoretical knowledge for Jesus. It's firsthand because he felt that too in the garden. Jesus understands our exhaustion, our temptation, our despair, our loneliness, our anxiety. He understands all of that firsthand because he went through it. And that makes him a perfect savior and provider for us. When you turn to Jesus as your savior and as your provider and as your king, you're turning to someone who understands your trials and sufferings firsthand. He's been through all of it. We're told in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus is our high priest. The high priest is a person who stood between God the Father and you. That's Jesus. He is your intermediary. He's your advocate between you and God the Father. You have a high priest who perfectly understands your struggles because he's been through all of them. He understands what you're struggling with, what you're suffering from, what you're worried about, what you're afraid of. He understands all of that firsthand because he experienced it himself. And as a result, as the verse says, he's ready to give grace and mercy and comfort at any time. I'd actually argue Jesus knows the grace and mercy you need better than you do. He's already been through all of it. And he's God. He has perfect wisdom. So he knows what you're going through firsthand. You can turn to him and rest in him. It reminds me when I met with my doctor one time, I, I had an ailment that I was really worried about. And my doctor kind of walked me through from kind of a knowledge perspective what you need to know about this ailment. And I was, I was grateful that he knew so much. I mean, really, he knew a ton about it. He had all this information. But what really changed the moment of that kind of scary interview with my doctor was when he said, I've had it too. And I got better. He told me that he had been through it and gotten better. And all of a sudden, I, I felt so much comfort and so much peace because now I knew that, that he understood firsthand. He had been through what I was facing. So very powerful when, when we look to Jesus and realize that he's been through everything that we have faced. So 
That's the first thing I want you to know this Christmas. If you're struggling, if you feel lonely, if you're suffering, if you're feeling anxiety, Jesus has been there. He understands it firsthand. Second thing to be aware of this Christmas, Jesus loves you more than you can imagine. And, and I need to unpack this for a moment. I need to help you understand where does this coming from, from the book of Revelation and this time of Christmas. So most of the suffering that you and I face in life is unavoidable. Most of the suffering that you and I face is, is just part of living in a broken body in a broken world. When we, when we have stress or discouragement or loneliness or sickness or hunger or pain, that's just life. Like life in this world is pain. There's no way to avoid that. No one can avoid it, but Jesus could have. That's the important thing to understand. Jesus is the one and only human who's ever lived who could have pushed the eject button at any time and been right back in the glory and bliss of heaven. No one made him come to earth. And remember, Jesus is the son of God. He's almighty. He's a conquering warrior. No one can make Jesus do anything he doesn't want to do. So when he chose to come to earth and, and live this life of poverty and humiliation and pain and suffering, no one was holding a gun to his head. No, he freely chose to do that. He chose to become one of us. He chose to be born in humility and poverty. He chose to live a life of obscurity and then to be, to be tortured and to be crucified. He did all of that. Why? Out of love. Out of love for you and me. And that's, that's ultimately what Christmas is about. It's not about the arrival of Jesus. It's about the outrageous love of Jesus. The, the only human who ever had a choice chose to come and suffer with us and suffer for us. That's an incredible truth that you see commonly through Scripture. I'll just point out a couple key passages for you. First of all, Ephesians 5, live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Jesus chose to, to give up that time in heaven and come and, and live in this pain-filled planet for us and to die for us out of love for us. I mean, his motivation and coming was love for you, love for me. That's brought out again in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. So what I want you to remember this holiday, if this holiday isn't all that you had hoped it would be, and it's discouraging and disappointing, I want you to remember that no one has ever experienced a worse Christmas than Jesus, and he chose it. He freely chose it out of love for you and me. He, he chose to experience that so that he could set you and me free from sin. And it may be that this is the first time that you've heard that truth. It could be that, that you have, have believed that you need to earn God's love. You, you need to earn God's approval by doing good deeds or reading the Bible or coming to church on a Sunday morning. I want to give you incredibly good news this morning. You don't have to earn God's love at all. No, it's already free, and it's already yours. He already loves you more than you could possibly imagine. And Jesus came to this earth and experienced all that humiliation and suffering 2,000 years ago. He did it with you on his mind. He did it out of love for you. You don't have to earn it. You just have to say, yes, I want that. I want to know the love of Christ. I believe that he is the son of God who lived for me and died for me to set me free from sins and rose from the dead for me so that I could have eternity with him. If there's anything that's kept you from just believing that the love of God is a free gift in Jesus, I want you to come talk to one of us this morning. That is the best gift we can give you today is that understanding. Please come talk to us. For those of us who have trusted in Jesus, then the, the challenge for us this morning is, is to remember that Christmas is all about the love of Christ and to keep that at the center this year. I think one of the challenges for us is that this is such a rough year. We're missing a lot of things that we take great comfort in during the holidays. So for most of us, we look forward to this time of the year because of things like Christmas parties and traveling to the relatives and being with friends and family and doing amazing things together. And that's really hard this year. For some of it's been canceled. Some of it looks very different. And for a lot of us, we're struggling and we're discouraged because of that loss of, of special events and traditions that go with Christmas. But what we need to remember is none of that is what Christmas is about. What Christmas is about is the unimaginable depth of the love of Jesus for us, and coronavirus can't diminish that at all. 
So for me, one of the things that's challenged me is when I feel sad about the traditions and events I'm losing this year, I'm convicted by the fact that really what should make me sad is that there are tens of thousands of people going to bed at night in this town who don't know the love of Christ. There's tens of thousands of people in this town who are suffering through all of the loss and pain of 2020 without the hope and love of Jesus. I mean, can you imagine that? Can you imagine having to go through 2020 without any hope? Without any hope of being with Jesus? Without any knowledge of the peace of Christ? That's what we should grieve. And so that should remind us that this holiday season, what's most important is to take this good news of the love of Christ we have and share it with those who don't yet know him, who don't yet have that joy and that peace down deep in their hearts to give them something to hope in in the midst of a very hard year. So I want to challenge you to be thinking actively today about who is it in your life that really needs to know that there is a God who loves them more than they could ever imagine. Who do you know that doesn't know that truth? How can you share that truth with them in words and deeds this week? Can you at least start praying that God would give you an opportunity to share that good news of the love of Christ with them? I want to pray for that. I want to pray that God will help us to share this unimaginable love of Christ with our friends, our relatives, our neighbors this week. And then I want to give you a couple announcements about events coming up here at Grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are on your throne in heaven right now. We praise you and we thank you that nothing that happens on earth can knock you off your throne, that you are still King of Kings, that you are almighty and eternal. We praise you that you are holy, that you are good, that you are gracious and merciful. We praise you, Jesus, for your incredible love for us. We thank you, Jesus, that you freely chose to leave the beauty and bliss of heaven to live here with us. You, the creator of heaven and earth, chose to become an infant who couldn't feed himself, couldn't clothe himself, couldn't even clean himself. You chose humiliation. You chose suffering, and you did it for us out of love for us, and we praise you for that, Jesus, and we pray that you would help us in the midst of a year where it feels like so much that we love at Christmas is being lost. Help us to remember what it's really about. It's about your unbelievable love, Jesus, your incredible love for us. I pray that our eyes would stay fixed on that and that what we would grieve most this holiday season isn't the loss of things we enjoy, but the thought of so many of our neighbors going to sleep at night without the hope of you in their hearts, Jesus. Help us to desperately want to share you with them, your love with them, so that they could come to know a God who loves them so much. Thank you, Jesus, for how good you are. We pray that our lives this week would glorify you, that they would be a, a small taste of this worship service going on in heaven, that we would show the world how wonderful you are and share you freely with all who will listen. Thank you for your love. We pray all this for your glory and renown, Jesus. Amen.